I remember. It happened yesterday or eternities ago. A young Jewish boy discovered the kingdom of night. I've had the remarkable pleasure and privilege of working with the Bernard Zell School all this year on a project related to the life and legacy of Professor Elie Wiesel, my teacher, our teacher, um, an enormous figure in our lives and in our future as well as our past, someone who left us many, many tools, stories, teachings, moments, and ways of thinking and ways of engaging with questions that we're facing today perhaps more than ever. How do we have students move through the trajectory of Wiesel's life from being a writer and a, a thinker into a person of action? I felt that we had a strong connection to our work on Wiesel this year, an integrated tech class, because we created an augmented reality map of different portions of his life and where things happened. In Jewish identity class, we connected passages in the Torah to Wazel's themes. In reading, we wrote picture books that incorporated Elie Wazel's values. In history, we read his book and learned about his life. And what I heard from the students over and over again, I heard a lot of passion, I heard a lot of caring about the world. I heard a lot of questions about Elie Wiesel, who he was. How could such a man become a person of great joy? Let me go back uh, to Transylvania. Sighet. Siget, yeah. The gag, yeah. Well, I grew up in a very religious family, and in a way, very happy. I had a mother, I had a father, I had sisters, I had friends, I had teachers, and I had books. I always loved books. And uh, all I, I remember really is going to school, or coming from school, or being in school. Occasionally, I would help my father, everybody else would, in, in the grocery store before holidays. Was there a sense of impending doom and fear and that the Germans were coming and not until they came. Never shall I forget that night, the first night in camp that turned my life into one long night seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the small faces of the children whose bodies I saw transformed into smoke under a silent sky. Never shall I forget those flames that consumed my faith forever. Never shall I forget the nocturnal silence that deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments that murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to ashes. Never shall I forget those things even where I condemned to live as long as God himself, never. I believe that the goal of teaching, of writing, is to sensitize the reader, to sensitize the pupil, to sensitize each other. <clears throat> I would like to create sensitivity, a heightened sensitivity, a heightened awareness of the other in, in those who read me or those who hear me. I said that Jewish priorities are my first priorities. They are not exclusive. Others are important to me. Other people, other ideas, other situations, other tragedies matter to me. And I believe, based on Professor Wiesel's teachings, that that's where everything begins. That's where environmental ethics begin. That's where ethics of speech, business, war and conflict resolution, it all begins with the awareness of the sacredness of the other. And if there's one thing that he taught us, it is that the otherness of the other is worth preserving. They have a face, they have an identity, and that we care about not just statistics, but about the one. Boris the Bear. Once there was a bear named Boris. Hi guys! Boris loved a hot chocolate, a good book, and campfires. But he was a bear, and bears are scary. But Boris wasn't scary. He was kind, and thoughtful, and sweet. The other bears said Boris was not a bear. But I am a bear, said Boris. Bears aren't nice, said the other bears. So Boris was mean. Boris was not nice. It was unbearable. I am a bear. I have claws. 
I eat berries and fish, so what's the problem? Boris decided to ask the other bears. Hey bears, yes? Why am I not a bear? Well, bears are mean, I guess. Then it came to him. Do you bears want to be mean? Well, we don't want to be mean, but we're bears. That's what we do, said the other bears. What do you like to do? Asked Boris. I like to knit. The guitar is my passion. Baking is my thing. This puzzled Boris. These bears were just like him. We can't live like this. How about a talent show, suggested the other bears. Now we can show off our differences. Boris knew this was an excellent idea. The talent show was a great success. All the animals of the island came. Barlin Mundo showed off his fiery side. Stephen the shark sang opera. And all the bears felt comfortable because they knew whatever they did, they could and would always be bears. The end. Giselle wanted to get a word out to people about how to be a better person. And that is what we were doing with our storybooks. The mission that you feel in 30 books is to make sure that memory of the Holocaust remains what? Remains a burning and luminous scar on our very being now until the end of times. Now may I tell you a story. Fifty years ago, somewhere in the Carpathian Mountains, a young Jewish woman read in a Hungarian newspaper a brief account about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Astonished, dismayed, she wondered aloud, why, she said, are our Jewish brothers doing that? Why are they fighting? Couldn't they wait quietly? The word was quietly until the end of the war. Treblinka, Ponar, Belgez, Helmno, Birkenau, she had never heard of these places. One year later, together with her entire family, she was already in a cattle car traveling to the black hole in time, the black hole in history, named Auschwitz. We know that memory was Elie Wiesel's great commitment. It was his watchword, as he wanted it to become ours. As he stated many times, if anything, it is memory that will save humanity. The commitment to memory, the perils of memory, the dangers of memory, at the same time, the inevitability of, of seeing memory as the source of our anguish, but also the source of our hope. One of the main themes I learned from him was the thought of memory and keeping everything in the past with you. Memory, to me, was the most meaningful theme we covered this year because I felt like it was the most relevant to today's world. And memory interested me the most because I've never thought about how history and memory are different before. I've never thought about how one person's story can be so much more powerful than just a big number in a textbook. Before this year, I had never really thought about what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust. I knew it had happened, but there was much to learn. We have to remember the stories of those who came before us and teach our kids these stories so that people are never forgotten. The only way you can have an ethical education is if there's memory involved. With memory and education, we can try to prevent history from repeating itself. We must bear witness to the stories that happened during the Holocaust and that it is our job to tell them. At one point, there's gonna be no more Holocaust survivors. We educate other people about what we learned and become a messenger of their, of their teachings. It's to remember and to act on Okay, so you're connecting memory and action. That it's not enough to simply remember, but there needs to be an active part. We can remember part. the Holocaust all we want, but that doesn't mean we're gonna do anything about it. Right. And in closing, Mr. President and distinguished guests, just one more remark. The woman in the Carpathian Mountains of whom I spoke to you, that woman disappeared. She was my mother.
I, I think this is the most interesting joke. So a Holocaust survivor eventually dies of old age and goes to heaven and he, he meets God and he tells God a Holocaust joke. And God goes, that's not funny. And he says, I guess you had to be there. Man can live far from God, not outside God. God is wherever we are, even in suffering, even in suffering. Reflecting on our own faith in God, in ourselves, in other people, in humanity as a whole, in our future, and the doubts that we have about all of those things and the idea that we can have faith and doubt together. I was much too religious not to question God. The biggest question is how, how do you accept when God is silent, um, which is something that he's questioning um, in the Holocaust. Think of what Elie Wiesel was doing in night. He's debating and arguing against God. A famous book that he wrote is called The Trial of God. They actually put God on trial. <coughs> And this is a, a reference back to something that took place in Auschwitz. To begin, who's bringing the charge? Me. I'll do that. What is the charge? What is the charge? Are you blind? Murder. Collaboration. Murder! Our ancestors, our forefathers, our parents all suffered but they did not let go. If Hitler is doing God's work, then logic says that to stand in Hitler's way is to stand in God's way. To take arms against Hitler is wrong. Now, does anybody here believe that? Is, is, is there any way that that could possibly be true? Isn't that insane? In one of my tales, an SS officer says to a young yeshiva student, some you want to live, he said, some will laugh at you, others will try to redeem themselves through you, people will refuse to believe you, you will possess the truth, but it will be the truth of a madman. In 1942, a Jew called Yaakov Grabowski escaped from Chelmno. He came to the rabbi in Grabov, and in Yiddish he said to him, Rabbi, he said, Mahar the folk. They are killing our people. And when the rabbi looked at him, the Jew said, Rabbi, you think I'm crazy? I am not crazy. We are not crazy. I'm speaking to you from my office. We're in quarantine, like so many of us. And our world is changing rapidly. And this kind of moment tests us. It shows us who we are. Sometimes you have to be a little bit crazy to see outside the box. If you'll notice, I've got up on the board um, what the what is happening to the stock exchange today. And this is all a function of the virus. Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Zell School in Lakeview was also closed Tuesday after the parent of a student tested positive for the virus. Madness. People die from the flu, and this is very unusual. And it is a little bit different, but in some ways it's easier, and in some ways it's a little bit tougher but uh, we have it so well under control. And, and in order to fight the madness that exists around us, we have to create a different kind of madness but a madness that is 
that cares about each individual and each person and each human being. It's difficult to speak about hope now, really, with all that's going on. Uh, but I force myself, you know, not to choose is also a choice, as can be, and he's right. And uh, what is the alternative? To give in or to give up? I wouldn't do that. So I, I, I invent hope. We were born to do something powerful and important and unique. And all of these students are in the search, as we all are, for that calling, that mission, that place where the world's need and their own passion comes together. When Ellie was all set, that the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference, it really stuck with me because I realized that if you're a bystander and if you do nothing, you are never helping the protagonist. You're always helping the villain. Anyone and everyone can and must be an activist and bear witness when they see injustice. Human suffering anywhere concerns men and women everywhere. He had to speak out, even if it meant going against presidents or prime ministers. And we have learned that when people suffer, we cannot remain indifferent. And Mr. President, I cannot not tell you something. I have been in the former Yugoslavia. I cannot sleep since of what I have seen. Something, as a Jew, I am saying that. We must do something. We had a lot of conversations about the power of action, of small acts, and the idea that they add up. We don't have to begin with a, a global project to change the world. We can start where we are. There's a lot of people that don't have access to pads, tampons, panty liners, and so they're not able to go to work or school or wherever they need to be. So we are working with an organization called the Period Collective, which is an organization that focuses on providing women dignity. So basically they collect and they donate supplies to people in Chicago. The world that we live in, the world that we've inhabited before coronavirus, the world that we've lived in for the last decades, and particularly the last decade or so, was created by adults. And there are many great things about our world, and there are also many broken things about our world that we haven't gotten right. The political prisoner in his cell, the hungry children, the homeless refugees, not to respond to their plight, not to relieve their solitude by offering them a spark of hope, is to exile them from human memory.